So there is this tiny little book that you might have heard of called What to Expect When You're Expecting. Yeah, that one. Well, today I'm sharing with you my conversation with the author of that book, Heidi Murkoff. By the end of this episode, you'll know the most important conversations you need to have with your provider before even trying to conceive. Hear Heidi's opinion on vaccinations, especially the COVID vaccine, after she's consulted with our country's health leaders. And finally, what habits do you currently have that could be affecting your fertility and pregnancy journey? Not only has Heidi and her company helped millions of women all over the world through all of the different avenues of what to expect, but she is one of the brightest lights I have truly ever met. To read her book is inspiring, but to hear her words is empowering. And I know you'll feel that way too. You are listening to the Mamas in Training podcast, giving expecting and new moms guidance and community from moms who have been there. And I am your host, Jessica Lorian. Because of an autoimmune disease, I'm not yet a mom. So while I work to get off my medications, I'm learning right alongside you. Listen in as I chat with experts about what they wish they had known before they entered motherhood. We're in this together. And now, on to the show. Truly, truly, this is just an absolute dream to sit down and talk with you. I'm still pinching myself over here, and uh, I'm really just honored. (laughs) Well. First of all, you've developed one of the most influential books and companies at this point, first publishing your book back in 1984, and you've really created a true legacy. I know it was birthed, you know, pun intended, yes. out of love. happenstance, right? Well, tell us, how did it all begin? Right, right. All those puns. How did it all begin? How did it all come about? So long story short, I got knocked up. <laughs> literally we we were kind of fast track from the start we we met in september got married in april and then three months later oops didn't see that coming <laughs> i guess i should have but i was that young and so i found out i was pregnant i went to the bookstore remember those places that sold books yeah remember? yeah they're nice and quiet remember? yeah uh, yeah so there were no books that there were like a handful, but none of them answered my questions. None of them uh, talked me off the ledge. And I desperately needed to be talked off a ledge because I had so many worries. And, you know, yeah, I could have spent 24 seven on the phone with the OB, but I didn't think that on the top of your list either. No. Um, So we worried a lot, both of us. And true story, two hours before I went into labor with Emma, I delivered a proposal for a book that would become what to expect when you're expecting. So it was a busy day. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. (laughs) Delivering two babies in the same day. And in neither case did I know what to expect. But I was a mom on a mission. I was determined to make sure that no parents ever worried as much as we had, you know, that they could sleep better at night, that they felt like someone was holding their hands through the experience, giving them a big giant hug. So that was the the whole premise that was the, I guess you could say conception of what to (laughs) expect and, or the birth of what to expect. And from there, I mean, I had, I had no expectations of writing a best-selling book or, or, or a series of books, nothing like that. I figured if a handful of parents were reassured, had their questions answered, then I would have accomplished what I set out to do. So that was, that was the mission. The mission has grown exponentially, but it's the same mission. It hasn't changed from that day where I just felt that moms and dads needed that kind of support, empathy. Funnily enough, the book, the books that I did read when I was pregnant were not written by people who had been pregnant before. And not to say that, you know, it's not like being pregnant makes you an expert in anything. Right. Right. Body. Right. Exactly. Um, But, but it does give you perspective. It's like, you have to walk a mile in those shoes to know why the shoes don't fit because your feet are swollen. It's Mm -hmm. that kind of experience that 
you you get in the trenches, you know, to know that you are not alone, you're not the only one experiencing these crazy random pregnancy symptoms, or you know, having a baby who won't stop crying at 3 a.m. Sometimes it just know it helps to know that you're not alone. It doesn't necessarily make all of those questions and concerns go away, but right. it helps you cope more effectively if you know you're not the only one. Exactly. Well, it's kind of funny because this podcast is right in line with everything that you do and advocate for at what to expect. The only difference being that I'm not yet a mom and I'm instead a mama in training. I I love that you take your research seriously. (laughs) I really, really do. I kind of wish I had done that right time so right. that I would have been better prepared. So you're going to be like way ahead of the curve. Right. right. Well, yeah, exactly. And I, I kind of thought when we had started in conversation and everything about how bringing you on here, you brought up the idea actually of having this conversation about where I'm at and where a lot yeah. of my listeners are at as a mama yeah. in training. So today I'd like to talk really mostly about preconception, preparing, planning, which of course, of you obviously, of course, have a book, What to Expect Before You're Expecting. It's the prequel. Yes, exactly. The prequel. It's perfect. And so, I mean, clearly we could sit and chat here yeah. all day, all night about all these elements, but what are a couple things maybe that we wouldn't necessarily think of doing that would be helpful, you know? Okay, so there are many, as you know, enough to write a book. Right. (laughs) I was going to say, and you probably have done them all, Mm -hmm. front to back, back to front. And so the journey is just beginning for you. But listen, my first time, as I said, knocked up, wasn't planning, wasn't preparing, wasn't taking my folic acid, wasn't take, actually, to be honest, we were kind of still on the honeymoon phase. So we were having a few cocktails, you know, maybe more than a few on occasion. So we weren't taking those steps that I would now (laughs) recommend to someone who has the luxury of planning and prepping. And of course, only half of pregnancies in the US and 40% of pregnancies worldwide are planned pregnancies. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Acts, you know, happy accidents happen. You're taken by surprise. That's one thing. Right. But actually, that's why I recommend that every woman of childbearing age and actually any potential father as well take a vitamin supplement, a prenatal vitamin for, for women, not necessarily for dads and <laughs> yeah. people do as long as it's got folate, but taking it all the time because pregnancy does have a way of sneaking up on you. But there there are many steps that you can take with the luxury of planning and prepping. For sure, a lot of moms are under the impression that if you start your prenatal, once you start trying, that's good enough, or even once you get the positive pregnancy test. But in fact, you never know when trying is going to become succeeding. Like it could take months, it could take years, or it could happen in one hot night, bingo, baby, bingo. Like, yeah. there you go. So that's why it's a good idea to start taking it ahead of time, at mm. least three months. But there's no harm again in taking it sooner. Also, getting preconception consult with your provider and looking at providers if you haven't started looking or if you don't have a regular provider or if COVID has totally thrown off that whole <laughs> yeah. strategy. And even if it's a if it's a consultation, a virtual consultation, at least, you know, discuss your lifestyle, your weight, things that might have an impact on fertility, but also on your baby's health. So some of the things would be changing up medications that you take over the counter or prescription and keeping in mind that if you have conditions, chronic conditions that require a medication, that most of them probably are going to be pregnancy and breastfeeding friendly, but right. not all of them. And maybe you can change or change dosage, take a lower dose, even things like antidepressants. And if you have a history of depression, this is not the time to throw your antidepressants out. Instead, have the conversation with your provider and possibly with your therapist about what medication options might be safer. 
and never wean yourself off. Like don't just toss them and yeah. fingers crossed everything's going to be fine because that's actually pretty dangerous to do. You need to do it under medical supervision. Mm. So medications, also your weight. So if, first of all, fertility can be impacted by being either overweight or underweight. So fat cells are made of estrogen. So whether you're a man or a woman, a lot of fat cells that can impact your fertility. A lot of estrogen sounds like a good thing. Like it's a female hormone. Let's go for the gusto. More yeah. estrogen, better. But in fact, it's a very delicate dance that reproductive hormones do. And they all have to work together in the right, in the right balance. So, and for guys as well, if they're packing a lot of extra pounds, that can impact their testosterone and it can increase their estrogen. And it doesn't mean you have to be, you know, at your ideal weight, but if you have to lose a significant amount of weight, take your time, do it wisely and do it healthily too. Cause that's another thing is, is, and if you're significantly underweight, cause that can also impact your fertility. If you exercise too much or too little, now's the time to find that right balance. How much coffee you drink, like you don't have to surrender your Starbucks card. However, <laughs> if you've got that like six, you know, shot latte habit, then you might want to start. Take it you know, back a little. Five and then four and then three and then two. Yeah. Or going half calf or that kind of thing. Because what you don't want to do is get pregnant and then the clock's ticking and like, then you have to give up everything all of a sudden right away. Same thing with smoking. If you're a smoker, the best time to quit is before you conceive. That said, anytime you quit is a good time to quit. And if you quit in your third trimester, that's better than not quitting at all. Mm. So, but these are things that take time Yeah, and they take support. So rather than, you know, put up an artificial timeline for yourself, think back of all the steps that you want to take, preferably if you have the luxury of, of, of planning, does your, do, do your eating habits, you know, are they, you know, maybe borderline or maybe, you know, they are, you know, more in the junk food category. Maybe you don't, you skip meals and skipping meals when you're pregnant is not a good idea. So just you know, it doesn't have to be anything major, but just keeping in mind that, you know, the average healthy diet is really what the, you know, that what a healthy pregnancy diet is, you know, with a good balance of, of lean protein and dairy and nuts, healthy fats and whole grains, those kinds of things. And it, it's hard to change habits. So if you have a lot of habits that need changing, that's why it's a good idea to make those changes now and things like vaccinations. Yeah. Kind of a hot topic these days, right? Yeah, exactly. I and, saw you have a um, conversation with Dr. Fauci. That was so exciting. That's right. And, and I actually just had a, a conversation with Dr. Walensky that's also going up. So from the CDC, it, the, the takeaway is whenever you're planning to get pregnant, it's a good idea to make sure that you are in the best health possible. Mm. You have health insurance, you have provider, and you are all ca caught up on your taking prenatal and you're caught up on your vaccines. And there have been some misconceptions passed around that, that COVID vaccine somehow impacts fertility. It does not. As Dr. Fauci explained to me and to the What to Expect community, mm -hmm. there is no mechanism by which that could happen because we're talking about messenger RNA. Yeah, two um, separate not things. Not something that can get in, invade your DNA. Right. But, you know, these days you read a lot, you hear a lot, and not necessarily from accurate so sources. So I would recommend that anyone who is planning to become pregnant get vaccinated as soon as possible. And mm -hmm. if you are already pregnant, same thing goes. Vaccination yeah. is safe and effective when you're pregnant and really critically important. It's so important as you bring up these different habits that we might just take for granted, not even yeah. realize that we're having that third cup of coffee, whatever it is. But if we do just start thinking about it 
not even, you know, I specifically have a very solid timeline because of my medications and everything else. But even if you're not in that means of trying to conceive yet, or even thinking about it, but once that time comes, the hormones that are going to rush through your body, the pressure that's going to come on all the other decisions that you're going to have to make Mm -hmm. are just going to be added on top of then something that's really challenging, like changing your diet or giving up smoking or any of these things that we're so used to. So I love thinking about it that way. And I didn't think about the prenatal vitamin. So I I'm file saving that for sure. That's a really, really oh, good. Yeah. Tip. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the, the worst thing that happens if you take prenatal vitamins and you don't get pregnant right away is you have better hair and skin. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't and want nails. that? <laughs> like seriously, what's the exactly. downside? I love um, that. And, and that's why a lot of experts recommend that. You know, the funny thing is preconception wasn't even a thing that, you know, yes. you just got pregnant. Mm-hmm. You didn't think about it. You didn't plan for it. Um, but for a variety of reasons, first of all, women are up against unfairly, by the way, that biological clock completely unfairly. And if you think about it, it makes no sense from an evolutionary perspective that we are living twice as long as our ancestresses did. However, we still have the same window of- Our geriatric date is the same. We're 50, right? right? Right. If you you put it into that perspective, but sadly, you know, that's just what we're, the hand we're dealt. And so, so it, 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 it is something that more and more women couples actually struggle with the actual getting pregnant. Um, and that's why, you know, making, taking all the steps because you can't control everything about your body. You just can't, you can't, con- no. you might as well get used to it. Cause once you're pregnant, you really you're can't control, control it. <laughs> and then yeah. you have a baby, uh, forget about control forever. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> these are one thing you can't control, and you never know exactly what to expect, and you can only expect the unexpected. Yeah. Um, but taking control of the things that you can control mm-hmm. is, first of all, really healthy. It influences your odds of conceiving, but it also makes you feel emotionally better. Right? I feel in control. I'm empowered. Absolutely. Be, you know, in a healthy place for this moment. And when I say healthy, and when I say eating healthy, and when I say I, it, you don't have to be, you know, driving yourself crazy if you can find organic grass fed, go for it. Like that's mm-hmm. fine. But if you can't, just eating a variety of healthy foods, it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty basic. Yeah. And you don't have to stress too much about it. But what I was saying about preconception is that in 2004, the CDC, which is what inspired me to start talking more about preconception and ultimately writing a book about it, they announced their their first preconception initiative. That was in 2004. That hasn't gone that far because still 50% of pregnancies are not planned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, we would have much better outcomes if they were planned. You know, there's, there's a lot of things standing in the way, but, but it is something that more, more couples need to be aware of. I think Mm -hmm. not to put pressure on yourself because making a baby should be fun. Right. Right. Hey, that should be the best part. Exactly. Making that baby. Exactly. And so adding a layer of stress is not necessary, but just feeling empowered. I can do this. And he, he can do it as well. You right. know, his, the amount of exercise he does, the kinds of foods that he eats, his weight, all of those things, his chronic conditions. So guys who have hypertension and diabetes, things like that, or overweight, they're more likely to have fertility issues, but their babies are also more likely to be stillborn or preterm birth, miscarriage. So, you know, we try, we tend to think of dads as just like, okay, they contribute the sperm, done. Yeah. yeah. But in fact, a lot more goes into that sperm and, and, you know, making it a healthy sperm. 
Yeah. So, and I, I just love saying sperm. Just love it. <laughs> I mean, I, I heard on, on I heard on a podcast recently, you talk about yeah. how you said penis on national television. I you did. were like the first I person did. to say it. <laughs> it was like, it was like 1990. And it was just not a thing back then. I don't know why it's a piece, you know, it's a, it, a, a part of the body, part. right. It's anatomically correct to exactly. say that word, but yeah. Oh goodness. Well, I'm glad that you've changed There's the way. Eyebrows. Yeah. Well, since you just touched on the fatherhood aspect of it, I've heard you talk about how you are a dad advocate, as you called it. Yes. And so, how have you seen the male or partner really shift over the past few years in the birth journey and in the in the preconception journey, even? Well, even when back in the olden days, when <laughs> in nineteen eighty five, when I had Emma, it was I mean, dads were at the birth even then. Interestingly enough, though, I travel around the world and I see different cultures and experience different birth experiences. I don't personally experience them, but I observe different- <laughs> Observe them. <laughs> that would be fun, going around the world having babies. Um, <laughs> but I, but I, I, I watch and I, I hear what the experiences that moms and dads have. And, you know, I was just a couple of years ago in Romania and dads then, that was just not even two years ago, were still not eager or even encouraged into the birthing mm. room. Now you would think Europe, maybe that's, yeah. but in fact, you go to places in the Middle East, Africa, India, Bangladesh, I've been <laughs> to all of them and more, mm -hmm. and fathers are not included in the process. So as far as we've come, and we've come far, we still need to go farther because we need to incorporate paternal leave, yes. leave paid leave for fathers into our legislation. Mm -hmm. We also need maternal leave. We need um, paid leave for every parent. That's yep. super important. But as far as we've come, and we still have a long way to go, we're still beyond other cultures and yet behind some because yeah, in other, in other parts ways. of Europe, it's just a given that fathers take time off to be with their babies, which is as it should be. Mm -hmm. But birthing experiences are very different around this country and around the world. And father's involvement, I feel, is so, so incredibly critical, not just to a baby and the baby's development, which if there's a father, that father can play a really vital role in nurturing, just in breaking many of the cycles we have in our culture of men are born nurturers. Guess what? They mm. are. They do have hormonal changes during pregnancy and postpartum. They have a surge in estrogen. They have a drop in testosterone. That is biology's way of saying dads matter. Yeah. They, 100%. They produce oxytocin when they do skin to skin. And yet we don't yet encourage that level of participation and in some cultures, they don't encourage it at all. I remember, I was just telling the story today, we were in a Somalian refugee camp on the border of Ethiopia. And we watched a class of, these were community workers within the refugee community who were being trained to help with lactation support. It sounds like, oh yeah, you know, of course everybody, no, it's not that easy. And especially when oh, you're a yeah. refugee. Um, uh, absolutely. So these, these community health workers were saying how they do it is through song and dance, not necessarily through a oh, written wow. curriculum. And this, this we've seen in a lot of different places, but they were so wise because they brought a man from the community who, you know, was part of the song and dance. And the idea was if if the fathers take care of the mothers, they can more successfully breastfeed, which by the way, is true. Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, your, your rate of breastfeeding success goes way up if your partner is supportive, mm -hmm. but so they were singing and dancing. The guy was singing and dancing. And then they had this baby doll and it occurred to me that I, I could point out something that they actually don't do a lot of in Africa, which I've observed in all of the different clinics and villages that we've gone to, they don't do skin to skin. They do it for the first few minutes of life and then not so much. And fathers don't do it at all. 
and skin to skin is is vitally important, not just in the hour after birth, but for a baby, you know, to nurture yeah. a baby, help a baby's development, help regulate a baby's temperature, help a mom with postpartum depression. All of these things are are established. Yeah. I handed the baby doll to the to the man and and then I showed him how to put it under his t-shirt. And he didn't understand quite at first why this doll was under right. the t-shirt, but I explained that it's, you know, that dads also need to snuggle their babies. Mm. You know, there was a communication gap, obviously, mm -hmm. but then they got it. And when they got it, they started singing and dancing with the guy wearing the baby. And it was, yeah. it, was just like, it was magical in so many ways, but it just shows how you just have to get to that point. Right. It is a natural process, but, you know, first you have to break those cultural taboos. Something else I noticed in South Sudan, what we were visiting midwife training programs there, and the, and more than half of the midwife students were men. So oh, wow. I'm like, that's interesting. I started talking to the men and young men, and they were the most amazing nurturing guys you could ever meet. And this is a country, by the way, where there's civil war, there's 13 year old boys being kidnapped and turned into soldiers. Mm -hmm. We saw 12 year olds with machine guns, that kind of thing. They're taught to rape and, to, you know, to, to do all of these terrible violent acts. But these male midwives were learning how to become nurturers. They were becoming midwives because they saw their mothers and sisters and friends and cousins dying in childbirth and they wanted to help. So it's that kind of thing. If you, if you set up a cycle where dads can become nurturers, you break other cycles, cycles of abuse and neglect. Yes. So I think it's all very, very in interconnected and you can't just wait till the baby's born. You know, dads should be in preconception, part of the team, part of the pregnancy, invested, involved. Right. Um, well, with that being said, important. what would you say would be some important conversations that we'd need to have with our partners, male, female, whatever it be, before that time comes? Even before we become mothers, there's a fa fair amount of maternal gatekeeping that goes on. I, I didn't coin that phrase, but I love using it because it's so true that women see this process as their own. Mm -hmm. But you need to have the conversation with your partner that this is something we are doing together. together. Yes. This is team baby. Mm -hmm. um, other conversations you have to have is about your relationship. You know, if you're trying to conceive, there's so much stress on your relationship to begin with, especially mm -hmm. if it takes a while. You know, if you score right away, great. But if it takes month after month after month, and he's starting to feel like a performing Chippendale, Right. And you're, right. you know, like, oh, it's time, honey, a receptacle for that sperm. Mm -hmm. um, then you're not, you're not taking the time to nurture it, the romance of it. And I feel it helps to have a sense of humor. <laughs> Definitely. True. Like quickie, you know, this, this works too. And just make a lot of laughs, but it's also important to, to see this as effort. Mm -hmm not as your baby project, right? You as the mom, as the one who's, you know, making this baby, you are making it together, not just from conception, before conception, at conception, after conception, at birth, after birth. This yeah. is something, and also, and a lot of moms and dads, couples, moms and moms, dads and dads, drift apart during this process. And that's why the most important form of intercourse is, is the conversation. Like yeah. sex is great. I am a big fan, but <laughs> Eric and I talk all the time. We work together. We live together. We travel together, but we talk all the time. You can't, no fair just talking about babies, right? Mm -hmm. you can't be the focus. I always say, you know, it's that love that creates this new life and it's that love that can best sustain it. Mm. You know, the love between the two of you, because a fetus grows, an embryo grows into a fetus, a fetus grows into a child, a child grows up and moves away from home. 
but the two of you are hopefully in it together for life. Mm -hmm. And that, and a lot of times parents put the couple on the back burner behind the couple of parents. They just become a couple of parents and lose that, that relationship that is so important for the two of you, but also for your child. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that time might be physical contact is so important. So yes, you have to have a lot of baby making sex, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you can't just like hold hands, right? grab his butt, Yeah, the other layers of intimacy, grab his thigh, like just Mm -hmm. cuddle on the couch and also have sex during other times of the month. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Always an end towards the means. It can Mm -hmm. just be fun, but I know it's stressful. I get that. And it, it, it takes a concerted effort when, when you're trying to get pregnant, when you're pregnant and postpartum as a new parent to keep that love life light burning. Now it's interesting because I find a lot in that preparation period when you're pregnant, it's all about the mom and the belly and you look amazing and, oh, and, and fitness and health and all of these things. Then the baby comes earth side and dramatic shift. It's all about the baby once they're earth side. So yep. what are some essential things that you would really encourage women to plan to have when that baby is earth side so that we're making sure we are also taking care of ourselves? Yeah. Well, that's incredibly important. And there's been fortunately more conversation than there used to be about Mm -hmm. mom's postpartum. But the sad reality is, is that in certain states, if you and half of births are are covered by Medicaid and that Medicaid coverage ends at two months in many states. So if you're asking moms, oh, take care of yourself postpartum, a lot of the complications, a lot of the mood disorders and things happen after that two month right. time period. And even for women who, who have private care or health, health insurance plans other than Medicaid, you still get that one and done appointment at right. the OB. You're supposed to get more, but you know, that chances are, and, so, and during COVID, a lot of moms didn't even get that. Mm-hmm. So you, you need that support. You need physical and emotional support because Recovery from childbirth and from pregnancy, no matter how you birth that baby, C-section, vaginal, slow, long, (laughs) in the car, you know, in the hospital, in your home, it still is a recovery process. It doesn't take six weeks. You know, I call bullshit on that. Yep. You know, it's a year plus. That's why we need coverage for moms a year and beyond a continuum of care, because by the way, also preconception care is often not covered. We need that continuum of care to nurture the nurturers, that's us, right? Physically, and then emotionally. We need a support system. We need our partners, if our partner's around, absolutely. But we also need to have a community outside of that, support outside of that. And most importantly, is to understand and remember and tell yourself over and over and over again that first mom being mom strong is a is just completely hype <laughs> like we have superpowers but we're not super humans yeah. so we have our limitations and we have to cut ourselves a, a lot of slack but sometimes being strong means asking for help i have said that to military moms i have said that to moms around the world. If you feel like you need support, you need to get it. You Mm -hmm. shouldn't tough it out. You shouldn't wait it out. You shouldn't, you know, hope that it passes. You shouldn't tell yourself, oh, I'm better than this. You know, I just got to pull myself up by my bootstraps Mm -hmm. and, you know, or, you know, slippers and just get on with it. (laughs) But it's not that easy. And for some moms, about one in six, who experience postpartum mood disorders or pregnancy mood disorders is a lot more challenging. Yeah. And that's a conversation. First of all, you should be aware of that and you should be alert for signs and you should be educated about, and everyone around you should be as well. That goes for your provider, that goes for your partner, that goes for your family. 
about what kinds of forms postpartum mood disorders or pregnancy mood disorders, which are common as well, can take. They don't manifest always as, you know how everybody says, I had the postpartum. It's kind of like shorthand for yeah. postpartum <laughs> depression. But there are lots of other ways that it manifests. You don't necessarily feel sad. Right. You could feel angry. You, you could feel extremely anxious anxiety disorder during pregnancy and postpartum, that's a thing as well. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And it can be equally devastating. You could have ruminating thoughts that you just can't shake, right. you know, whether it's thoughts of harming yourself or thoughts of harming your baby. I, I hear all of these things from moms all the time. Maybe you're having a hard time attaching, or maybe you're attaching so hard because you're so anxious that you won't let anyone near your baby. You won't put your baby down because you're so scared. Mm. there's postpartum OCD, postpartum PTSD. If you've had a traumatic pregnancy, even trying to get pregnant, having losses, then having a successful pregnancy, a difficult delivery, any of these things can trigger postpartum PTSD. So there's Mm. lots of different ways that it shows up and you just need to be aware of what's normal and what's not normal. So Mm. baby blues are normal. Those come almost immediately they're, they're gone or start fading by two weeks. Other kinds of, of, if you can't function, you need to go seek that help. Classes, absolutely. <laughs> A doula, absolutely. Mm. I feel like every mom deserves a doula during the end of her pregnancy, during delivery, and also postpartum. Yeah. Because moms need support too. Exactly. And it isn't just about the baby you know, we, we, we have to focus on our own recovery as well. So those, those are some things that you should look to, but might not be realistic to have, you know, plan a a weekly spa day, (laughs) but you know, if, if you can get around to washing your hair, that's a, that's a good day Yeah, and you'll feel better. So also getting out, getting exercise can help a great deal. Listen to your body. That's probably the best yeah. And there are lots of places too, if people are listening that of course, wish everyone could have a doula, but that costs money, some sort of community. Oh, well, I'm working support. on that. Working on that. I brought res- legislation for I military moms. That. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be covered under TRICARE. Military moms need that because they they often Absolutely. have partners who are deployed. They're far from their family and friends and their network of support. But also I'm one of the biggest issues is that doulas should be covered by health insurance. Yes. And if they were ha- covered by health insurance, we wouldn't have to worry about paying for them. Yes. And it's a tiny fraction of the amount of other kinds of care. It's added value exponentially oh, yeah. for a tiny fraction of the cost, but still a cost that many moms cannot afford. And that's mm-hmm. why it should be affordable. Oh, that's so amazing that you're working on that. No, it's so important. Yeah. I wanted to just recognize that there are other places that people can get support for free. I know that what to expect has a lot of different options and resources there. Can you just share a few of those for people listening? Well, we have, we have message boards and community. We have an Mm -hmm. incredibly active, engaged community. And one thing I like to think about our community and it's sort of the standard that I have tried to set for the community is that this is supposed to be a safe, caring, nurturing space where you're not judged because that's really important. A lot of social media is about judging and being judged. And we are all about it, what to expect, about supporting and being supported. Motherhood is the ultimate sisterhood. I Mm -hmm. can't emphasize that enough. We're all sisters. And no matter what our difference is politically, religiously, culturally, geographically, we are connected by an emotional bond. And that's sort of the spirit of what to expect. So yeah, we have, we have communities for those who are trying to conceive. We have communities for those who've gone through a loss, which, uh, you know, a lot of moms have gone through and need that support desperately Mm -hmm. for moms who are having issues with fertility for military moms, high risk pregnancies, so mm-hmm. that you can get support no matter what your situation is, as well as knowing that there's a lot of 
people going through the same experience at the same time. Yes. Who get it. Because nobody right. gets a mom like another mom. Let's face it. Yep. A hundred percent. The last thing I just wanted you to touch on is just something a little bit more personal. And I think I might know what it is, but let's see what you say. <laughs> if you if you could go back in time, all the way back to 1984 and 1985, and tell yeah, your pregnant the book, self something. The book it didn't come out till the very end of 84. So it, was, okay. it, it wasn't in the stores until 85. Okay. And I was 12 for the record. So. <laughs> I was barely an adult. Oh my I was gosh. My yeah. God. Well, back, back, the back Heidi then, back, back then. Back in the olden days. What would you tell that Heidi back then? Oh, I would tell her everything because that girl did not have a clue. <laughs> that girl <laughs> knew absolutely nothing. And, and so I would have lots and lots and lots of information to share with her. However, if I were, if I were going to tell her one thing, of course, and you know what it is, it's stop and smell the babies. 100%. Like just don't blink. I blinked. Now my daughter is on the cover of what to expect when you're expecting mm. the daughter who I got knocked up with, who, oh, you know, inspired amazing. what to expect, you know, that, that was with her first pregnancy. And, you know, she happened to be pregnant when I was coming out with a new edition. I'm like, Hey, that sounds great. Yeah. Got a uterus full of baby. And then Lennox <laughs> went on the cover of first year. Cause he was in the right uterus at the right time. But oh. the point being is I used to wait for every day to be over. I mean, you hear this a lot. The days are long, but the years are fast. Well, believe it. Mm. Just believe it. Because I blinked. The kids are all grown up. Now, the good news is I have two grandsons. Yeah. So it's not like, you know, it, it was game over, but right. it's game beginning in a different way. New chapters, yes. But But I do wish that I had stressed less and enjoyed being pregnant more. And by the way, what I really want to do over on is maternity clothes. Like <laughs> so not fair. I had <laughs> the most amazing belly. I have no photographic evidence of it because uh, we didn't have a camera, obviously mm -hmm. didn't have a cell phone with a camera, had one Polaroid. So Wait, what was that one that I saw you recently posted? Wasn't yeah, yeah that, that was, that was my second pregnancy. But oh, okay. Three, okay. I, I saw had, your second. I, I recycled the same Three okay. photos that I Polaroids <laughs> that I have of myself pregnant because we didn't take pictures. But I do, I can tell you that the clothes were so incredibly hideous, oh. like these polyester pup tents, sleep mm -hmm. sleep with family of four under, and also <laughs> maternity jeans. I had one pair of maternity jeans for both pregnancies. They had this giant spandex thing that went up to my boobs. Oh my gosh. And they were short and wide legged. And mm. oh my God, if I could go back in time and wear all of Emma's maternity clothes mm -hmm. uh, and people would have thought, what is she wearing? Yeah. <laughs> I think we need to call the police. Exactly. You know, that's an obscenity, but still point being that, yeah, I would like to redo that. And I love oh. being pregnant. I miss it breastfeeding too. Oh my gosh. Heidi, thank you so much. My gosh, I could just talk to you forever and ever, but it's just, it's truly, you have no idea. It's truly been an ultimate dream. And as a mama in training, who's just been trying to drink from the fire hose and learn everything <laughs> that I possibly can, that's what it's felt like. Yeah. You and what to expect has just, I mean, it's given me more than I could ever dream. And I know that I have so much more to learn. Well, I'm just grateful. Like I said, you're already, you know, got a head start, which is <laughs> awesome, but I'm just happy to be on the journey with you. I really am. So, you know, I'm always there for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. Well, there it is. You heard it first from the best-selling author, Stop and Smell the Babies. This chapter that you're in right now, it might seem like it's never going to end. I know but I promise it will. And remember to take those few moments when you can throughout the day to take those deep breaths. If you want to know that you're not alone and get more support from other moms, then join us in the Mamas in Training Facebook group today so you can find other mamas in your shoes. Just simply click the link in the show notes and be ready for a blanket of support and love from other mamas who are in this with you. I can't wait to see you there. And finally, just a quick word from one of my favorite cozy companies.
Okay, I have a confession. It's safe to say that I spent 95% of the past year and a half in comfy clothes, and most days, PJs. Yeah, it's true. And you might have too, and you know, that's okay. I give you permission to always be cozy. And lucky for you, I have found the coziest clothes around from Kindred Bravely. From their PJs to their leggings, bras, shirts, and unbelievably cozy sweaters, they're perfect for this fall weather. And for always, let's be honest. Every piece of clothing I have from Kindred Bravely is made out of the most luxurious fabric I have ever felt. It's like wearing a soft cloud all day long. The best thing about Kindred Bravely's products is that the founder and CEO, a mother of two, created them with you in mind, a woman and a mom. Since I'm a mama in training, I haven't personally used their nursing bras. However, I surveyed my community of mamas and almost 100% of them recommended Kindred Bravely over another nursing bra. So if you're ready to get cozy, it's time to treat yourself. Go to kindredbravely.com and use the promo code TRAINING20 to get 20% off. That's K-I-N-D-R-E-D-B-R-A-V-E-L-Y dot com and use the code TRAINING20. The link is in the show notes. Here's to getting cozy. If you enjoyed the show today, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and leave a review on Apple Podcasts so I know how to better serve you. I'd also love for you to join our community of Mamas in Training on Facebook. You can find me at Mamas in Training on Instagram and at mamasintraining.com. For Mamas in Training, I'm Jessica Lorian. We're in this together. <laughs>